In our last video, we looked at five mocktails that you can use to end Dry January off on a strong and interesting note, but there was one major player, the Shirley Temple, missing from that lineup. We won't be talking about the history of the Shirley Temple specifically today, but rather we'll be looking at one of its base ingredients and deconstructing some of the confusing history that surrounds it. The history of Grenadine on today's episode of Mike's Hard Reviews. Hey there, hi there, ho there, my name is Michael. Welcome back to Mike's Hard Reviews. It's great to have you guys here today. I'm a bartender and mixologist from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And yes, today we're gonna to be talking about the very long reaching and surprisingly complex and confusing history of grenadine, a very common uh, cocktail ingredient that appears in a lot of classic works. Now, like I said, this is quite a complex uh, notion here. I've got four full pages of notes to go over with you guys. So strap in, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a time. <laughs> To start off, I want to talk about even what grenadine is and break down some of the confusion about what we are talking about in total. This here is grenadine, which is a cocktail or mocktail syrup that is derived from water, sugar, and pomegranates, sometimes including other ingredients like pomegranate molasses for extra flavor or orange or rose blossom water for additional complexity. Those last two aren't always going to be there though. So really the root of what grenadine is is a cocktail syrup derived from pomegranate juice and sugar and nothing else. Now, you may not know this because in the modern day, a lot of grenadines don't even include pomegranate as an ingredient, nor do they taste like pomegranate. And there's a very stupid reason why that's the case. But before we get to that, we have to go back way, way further to the origins of where grenadine even comes from. You see, pomegranates are native to regions that are now modern day Iran and northern India. And in those regions, as far back as 3000 years prior to the first written mention of a grenadine in any form, modern or otherwise, People in these regions were using them as ailments or treatments for ailments like dysentery and tapeworm and mouth sores, something that is replicated by Greco-Roman authors and physicians, uh, and then that information makes its way to France. The first time that we see the word grenadine in writing, it is in France, in 1769 specifically. That appears in a very verbosely titled medical journal entitled the Secrets of Nature and Art, developed for food, medicine, veterinary arts, and arts and crafts, written by one uh, Pierre Joseph Yohos. It would have been really, really nice if you found a way to describe those things without using the word art so much. I feel that this feels a little, a little verbose. <laughs> Needless to say, this is the first time that we see any written mention of a grenadine or pomegranate based syrup. Uh, in writing, and back during this time, it is still a medicinal supplement, something that is used to flavor uh, medicines and make them more palatable for people so that they stick with their regimens. Kind of like how uh, juleps, the original presentation for juleps, was also as a way to mask the flavor of various medicines. Now, while the first written mention of a grenadine or pomegranate syrup comes in 1769, it's not till 100 years later that it makes its way overseas to America, the product of one Victor Relay, who co uh, co copyrights patents Patents. <laughs> Who patents the first commercially available grenadine in 1869, and it is wildly popular. It becomes a very steadfast ingredient in various pro uh, proto cocktail creations and as a flavoring for various other drinks, and still, to a certain extent, maintains its medicinal properties. However, starting almost immediately after Victor finds success in his production of grenadine, we start to see competitors come up, and the American market is really invested in finding quality grenadines. A lot of these people, though, aren't making quality grenadines. As early as 1870, competitors are really, really trying hard to dig into Victor's profit margins, and they're doing so with products that are not, by traditional definition, grenadines. Some of them don't contain sugar. They contain sugar alternatives. Most of them don't contain pomegranate in any regard. A lot of them rely on artificial flavors and colors to mimic the presentation of grenadine, and overall, what the market is being filled with is really, really subpar quality items. In 1870, Victor does file suit against some of his competitors uh, very, very early on in the process to try and keep them from producing these things that are calling themselves grenadines, but are not actually grenadines because they contain no pomegranate. Now, this is a long process. It takes nearly 40, over 40 years actually, for this to finally be federally settled in the US Supreme Court. Funnily enough, in a case entitled United States versus 30 cases of grenadine, in general, what comes out of this case is that Victor loses. The judges find that in America, there's not a very strong connection of uh, consumer opinion to 
the truthful information of what pomegranates are or taste like. Therefore, because US consumers are not familiar with pomegranates and thereby grenadine because they don't really understand what it's supposed to taste like, commercially available products that refer to themselves as grenadine do not need to actually taste or convey the truthful flavor of pomegranate. And um, the market maintains its ridiculous fake grenadine supplies. That court decision in and of itself is still in effect to this day. And it's the reason why products like Rose's Grenadine can exist now. Now, I don't wanna spend a bunch of time talking about Rose's Grenadine because unlike Rose's Lime Cordial, there's not really a good reason for it to exist. And as a matter of fact, I would argue it probably shouldn't exist at all anymore. But I do wanna give you a primer on it because it is the most ubiquitous version of Grenadine that exists today. Rose's Grenadine comes to market in 1982. It is the product of the conglomerate that owns both Mott's and Canada Dry. It is not a sugar syrup. It is made with high fructose corn syrup. It contains no pomegranate flavor, uh, natural of any kind uh, whatsoever. And it is also artificially uh, dyed uh, and it doesn't taste like pomegranates and you should never buy it. <laughs> I will go out on a limb here and give you the not very hot take that Rose's Grenadine is garbage and you shouldn't use it. I don't even own a bottle to show you. I'm putting up a picture, like a PNG on the screen right now because I don't have a bottle to show you. It's not worth owning. But that US Supreme Court decision is what allows things like that to exist today. And while I would argue that now we have a much different appreciation for what real Grenadine is, that's probably what you're going to find and why so many people have an association with Rose's Grenadine as what Grenadine is supposed to be. I, I digress. <laughs> now, whether we're talking about more commercially available Grenadines, which by the way, there are exceptions to this sort of rule about not using commercially available products. Whether we're talking about that or real grenadine, there are a lot of different uses in which we can employ them. If you're using real grenadine, you're going to find a lot of success with classic cocktails. Things like the El Presidente, the Ward 8, the Scofflaw, the Mexican Firing Squad, the Bacardi Cocktail. Uh, these very traditionally and very carefully uh, technique, techniqued produ you know, productions of classic cocktails. The reason why these things tend to work so well and make long-standing variations to other cocktail platforms, like for example, a Bacardi cocktail is just a pomegranate daiquiri, uh, is because grenadine, when it's made with real pomegranate juice, has a very unique character to it that gives it very bassy, low tone, uh, dark fruity notes, and a prominent tartness that reinforces what you would find in citrus. It sort of gives it this additional dimension and complexity that you wouldn't find if you were just using a regular simple syrup. To a certain extent, you will find use in commercial grenadines uh, because they tend to be thinner and sweeter and function more like a simple syrup. If you're making something along the lines of like a tequila sunrise, uh, you would see it being used there appropriately. The strong pigments of the red grenadine that's supposed to be in a tequila sunrise is not as pronounced in real grenadines. And it, can make a much more blah color. Then again, though, you're not really going to find uses for grenadine that are specifically the things like roses and other commercially available grenadines in a lot of very high quality cocktails or mocktails because it's just not a high quality product. So in general, you could make any one of those things with a real grenadine and they'd be much better. Even if you don't find a lot of uses for commercially available grenadines like roses, there is one very, very long standing cocktail, or I guess in this case, mocktail, that you probably know relies very heavily on it, the Shirley Temple. Now, like I said, there is actually kind of a very interesting discussion to be had about the Shirley Temple in and of itself, but it's involved enough and yet still vague enough that I don't think we could fill enough space with it appropriately. So to give you the bullet points on it, the Shirley Temple is a mocktail that was invented uh, under the namesake and likeness or inspired by the child star of the same name. No one knows fully who invented it. They begin to appear as early as night, or rather accounts of it being made be, start to show up in 1926, I think. Uh, and there are a bunch of different bartenders and restaurant managers and people who are claiming to come up with it. It's kind of confusing, but regardless of what people are saying, there is a consistent way to make one. It's a glass of uh, ginger ale with a splash of grenadine served with those bright red preservative laden uh, Sunday cherries. Not maraschinos, they call them maraschinos, but they're not. They're those gross ass Sunday cherries. It's a, it's a long standing mocktail. It's, actually, by some accounts, in fact, many accounts, the first mocktail, and it's extremely popular, unless you are Shirley Temple herself. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the Shirley Temple for this exact reason. Uh, Shirley Temple, um, 
I don't know a ton about her history personally, but she is uh, a child star uh, who was popular in the late 20s, early 30s, and uh, she would later go on to her life to do a lot of um, philanthropic political work and become representative for Czechoslovakia. It's a whole thing. But in 1982, uh, no, excuse me, 1986, she gives an interview uh, with a host uh, on an NPR radio show, uh, and in that, they mention the Shirley Temple, and she fucking hates them. Temple told NPR Scott Simon that everywhere she went around the world, people couldn't resist serving her a concoction of 7-Up grenadine syrup orange juice with a maraschino cherry. The Shirley Temple, those saccharine, icky drinks. Those are the ones. Yes. Well, those were created in the probably middle 1930s mm -hmm. in Hollywood, and I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Apparently... Uh, giving somebody a glass of sugary, sweet, saccharine carbonation every time they show up at your restaurant is not only not appreciated from somebody who has a more refined palate than that, but it's also a very tired, exhausting joke, according to her account. She hates them. She hates them. So far, so far in as to have uh, levied a lawsuit against somebody in the 1990s, I think, uh, who was trying to bottle like a soda version of a Shirley Temple uh, to keep it from coming to market, which... More power to her, frankly. Uh, despite her own hatred of it, the Shirley Temple is still really popular nowadays. And in fact, apparently here in the Midwest, because I'm here in Michigan, the name Kitty Cocktail has been given to that as sort of like a kid's cocktail, like sweet, sugary, sweet soda thing, um, like native to our region. That's how deep set the Shirley Temple is. The thing is, the Shirley Temple, it comes from a time uh, pre-Dark Ages, around the era of the success of pre- and post-prohibition cocktails. Uh, and even then, it's not being constructed by very strong rules. Uh, a lot of what it, it's made out of is just not good. So the modern cocktail renaissance in which we exist today actually has taken the Shirley Temple and made it something really worth drinking. That is called a Don't Call Me Shirley, which is the creation of a woman named Colleen Kenny, the bar manager at Nostrana in Portland, Oregon. This is sort of a deconstructed version of what a Shirley Temple is, featuring uh, homemade grenadine, fresh lemon and lime juice, and club soda, uh, although you could also say ginger ale or ginger beer are appropriate to hearken to the original creation. It's sort of given off as this very much uh, modernized version of it that's fun and interesting to sip on and has real fresh ingredients in it and, in my opinion, is going to make for a phenomenal way to cap off this episode. So let's go ahead, set our notes aside, and we will make a Don't Call Me Shirley. The Don't Call Me Shirley presents the Shirley Temple as a more traditionally built highball, so we're gonna build this one in the glass. We're gonna grab a chilled highball out of our freezer, and we're gonna start off with a full one and a half ounces of a house-made, homemade, all-natural, very much real, not roses, grenadine. At Nostrana, they use a house-made grenadine with a very specific recipe. It's mentioned uh, on Looker.com exactly how they make that. Uh, I'm using my own version of grenadine, which is a little bit more simple. Uh, you'll find the recipe for that in the description down below. Next up, we're gonna come behind that with some fresh citrus juices. That includes half an ounce of freshly squeezed lime juice, and then half an ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice. That's actually everything that's to start this off, but I am going to make uh, one very slight adjustment. The Don't Call Me Shirley is marketed as using uh, club soda. I am instead going to use some Fever Tree ginger beer, uh, just to give it a little bit more uh, spice, make it a little bit drier, and um, present it closer to what a traditional uh, Shirley Temple would be. I crack this open and then add a small amount of it to the bottom of our glass. Take your cocktail spoon and stir that together to combine. We'll come behind that and fill up our glass with some ice. And then we'll take the rest of our ginger beer and top up our mocktail. There's actually a very specific garnish for the Don't Call Me Shirley. Uh, the folks at Nostrana use specifically Amarena cherries, but those are kind of expensive and hard to find around me. We're gonna garnish this instead with a couple of Luxardo cherries. Put those on a spear, like so. Rest those down alongside our ice right there at the top. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a Don't Call Me Shirley. Alrighty, with our station cleaned up, let's go ahead and give our Don't Call Me Shirley a taste. I have actually uh, never tried this one before, so I'm very excited to see how this turns out. Cheers. Oh, 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 oh my 
God. Oh man, that is so fun and ah. So immediately I wanna say, it really does actually hit on some of those notes you find in a more traditional Shirley Temple, where you've got the combination of the ginger and this like kind of berry-esque sweetness. It's definitely a lot more evolved and appropriate and and diverse here though, because rather than what you're getting in a traditional Shirley Temple, which is sort of this kind of vague berry-ish flavor that is just simply the color red, this actually tastes like pomegranates. It tastes very distinctly like pomegranates, this very rich, deep berry flavor, dark berry flavor, kind of like cherries, but it's it's different from that. It's, it's also sweeter and more round, less sharp. It, it's hard to describe exactly what a pomegranate tastes like if you've never had one, even though I have, so. it's It's got that same combo of things, this berry flavor and the ginger, but the difference is this is a lot drier. It's not so sweet. Its sweetness is coming from a much more natural place, and it's moderated by this really just nice dual combo of lemon and lime, which, I mean, how could you possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> it opens on the berry flavors of the pomegranate, which is very dark, rich, deep, full-bodied, and three-dimensional because it has its own degree of tartness to it, which does start to come up a little bit as the ginger beer that we're using here sort of comes in behind that and gives it this nice little spicy characteristic and it sort of reminds you that you're drinking something that isn't just a juice, but is like a, a concoction, a, a cocktail, a mocktail, a delicious thing. Holy shit, Colleen. The lemon and lime are sort of playing together with each other after that point. There is a distinct point in the flavor, uh, the sort of evolution of the flavor that is very, very sharp, very acidic, very, very tart. Um, but I like that. It opens sweet, ends tart, mellows out with that ginger spice towards the end. It's very, very nice. And it's got a really fun evolution in that way then, which is not something you would traditionally find with a regular Shirley Temple. It's very, it's very, very nice. I, I do want to say I do think it is a, a hair sweeter than I want it. I'm using a double, a double grenadine here, so two parts sugar, one part water. If you're gonna do that at home, I would say don't go above maybe one and a quarter ounces of uh, grenadine rather than one and a half, which is what they call for, because the Nostrana house grenadine is a one-to-one -one with pomegranate molasses for additional flavor. That's gonna get you a more balanced level of sweetness here. This also has a really, really thick mouthfeel to it, which is not um, not particularly common with things lengthened with soda, um, but because that syrup is so much of the body of it, it can't help but be a little thick. And I don't mind it personally, but it is definitely, you know, something that some people might have a problem with. That said, it is still phenomenal. Actually, it just needed to be mixed a little bit. I had to mix it a little bit. There was too much, too much at the bottom. No, that's good, that's good. Uh, like I said before too, I substituted the club soda in the original recipe for the Don't Call Me Shirley um, with Fever Tree uh, ginger beer, a really spicy ginger beer at that. I mean, this is some of the best stuff you can find on the market. If you're not gonna use this, use like cock and bull or something with a little bit of heat to it, you know? I do like that a lot. I, I feel like it adds a sort of more complete uh, dimensionality to the cocktail than club soda would because it would just be flat carbonation at that point. Um, then again, though, if that's what you're looking for, that would be a little bit lighter and more uh, more embracing of the fruity notes of the grenadine, which, you know, might not be bad. In either case, whichever thing you choose to lengthen it with, whether you want to hearken to old times or new times, this is a phenomenal mocktail and one that I think I'm going to be enjoying very, very much as I very peacefully await the coming of February 1st. <laughs> well, that is all I have for you guys today. Let's go ahead and do our reading from Crisp Toasts. We were in the adversity section before we came back from our short beginning uh, of January break. And I kind of just chose one from that section in order to continue us. We will be continuing from the adversity section because I just found a really fucking funny one with today's toast that goes as such. Don't let the bastards grind you down. <laughs> Jeez. Short, sweet, to the point. I can get behind that. Hey, it's kind of like this, actually. That's pretty good. Only you're serving this long, so that's not quite perfect. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Mike's Heart Reviews. If you guys just enjoyed it, please remember to like the video and subscribe down below. That's the best way that I know you're enjoying the content that I'm producing and how I am producing it. If you want to, you can find me on other, uh, other places, various social media that are appearing on the screen now or have been up for some time. Uh, I'm usually just here and on TikTok, so if you're going to follow me anywhere, pick those two places, but I'll always be here. New episodes of the show come out every single Friday and then sometimes on Tuesdays. And the 
the first episode that we have next Friday will be the first return to traditional cocktail content. Um, but if you guys do like the mocktail content that we produced this uh, dry January, please do let me know, and more mocktails shall be on the horizon as a result. Thank you again all so much for watching. If you enjoyed, do all that good stuff. And remember, please, to drink responsibly and have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.